Hello, I'm Dr. Nicholas Tedesco, DO Associate Program Director for the Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center Orthopedic Surgery Residency Program. Today I'll be lecturing on the topic of mega endoprosthetics, really more pertaining to their role in tumor surgery as opposed to arthroplasty, but that will be touched on a little bit. This will be part of our ongoing online didactic session that will supplement our formal in-classroom learning, especially our case-based presentations. I do continue to have the same disclosure in that I own stock in an orthopedic rehabilitation company called Rom Tech, but it has nothing to do with this talk. So first thing, we'll talk about a brief history of arthroplasty and its eventual expansion into mega endoprosthetics. This begins with Themistocles Gluck, a German surgeon back in 1890 who made the first ever endoprosthesis. It was actually a total wrist arthroplasty made from ivory for rheumatoid arthritis. He was also the first one ever to make a hip hemiarthroplasty out of ivory as well for avascular necrosis in 1891. Heavy metal began being used after glass and ceramics and some other things were tried first. The first metal total hip arthroplasty was performed in 1940 by Dr. Austin Moore in Columbia, South Carolina. The first metal total knee arthroplasty non-rotating hinge was performed in 1951. The Vitalium endoprosthetic, which is the cobalt chromium that we still continue to use today, and later the Mark I through IV, which was composed of stainless steel. These were done by Dr. Borg Waldius in Stockholm, Sweden. Early failures of this were due to over-constraint, uh, basically early loosening or periprosthetic fracture because it recreated a fixed hinge with no accountability for rotational or coronal plane motion of the knee. Additionally, as you can see in this picture, there was nothing but metal on metal articulations everywhere. So there was fretting, fatigue, and implant fractures, metallosis, and multiple other causes of failure that ultimately led to the development of polyethylene and the rotating hinge component. So mega endoprosthetics are the replacement of more than just a simple joint surface. So when we talk about primary arthroplasty, usually we're talking about a joint resurfacing procedure. This is where we start to have bulk replacement of bone. Bulk allografts were used as replacements as early as the 1950s before we had some of these endoprosthetics. In 1979, Salzer et al. described the use of a modular ceramic endoprosthesis for replacement of a resected proximal humerus. This was a custom prosthesis that they had made for a specific patient. In 1980, Katz, Nelson, and Nerube performed a total femoral reconstruction directly onto the native tibia without an articulating tibial component for a total femur replacement. So this was sort of the very beginnings of mega endoprosthetics. Initially, they were only available as custom prosthetics and on a case-by-case -case basis. They had really long manufacturing times, and the problem with custom is if you measured incorrectly or if you get into surgery and maybe a tumor has grown and you have to cut the bone differently, you only have one size that you've created. So the modularity and the ability to roll with the punches, as they say, was extremely difficult with these prosthetics. The manufacturing time back in the 1980s was up to six months for some of these to be made. And actually, it was the reason that neoadjuvant chemotherapy for osteosarcoma was serendipitously discovered. As we started transitioning away from amputation surgery for those patients and more into limb salvage, and we were using custom implants, we didn't want the patient to sit there for three to six months with a smoldering osteosarcoma. So we started hitting them with chemotherapy as we waited. And lo and behold, we found that actually provided some survival benefit and an ability to evaluate the tumor for chemonecrosis after surgical resection, which greatly helped in prognosticating for these patients and determining future treatments. As indications expanded to not only tumors, but complex revision joint reconstructions, staged infection reconstructions, complex fractures, these became more commercially available and modular to custom fit each case off the shelf without having to go through either compassionate use exemptions with the FDA or the custom implant manufacturing issues. So now we'll begin with the implants and we'll kind of take this through anatomically starting with the upper extremity to the lower extremity and pelvis. Proximal humerus replacements are exactly what they say. They replace the upper end of the humerus. As you can imagine, it matters where that resection takes place. Can you salvage the deltoid? Can you salvage the rotator cuff? Can you salvage the pec? 
all of those are going to play a big time role in function and failure rates and stability postoperatively. So this is a heterogeneous group of quote unquote replacements. These are often used in rotator cuff deficient or multiply reconstructed where the rotator cuff is removed and blocked with the tumor. So usually either a large hemiarthroplasty or a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty construct is needed when you're talking about doing a proximal humerus replacement for tumor reconstructions. These do demonstrate good functional outcome results with wear properties similar to conventional reverse total shoulders, which is pretty amazing when you think about how much anatomy is usually altered with these sorts of surgeries. There's a 90% 11-year implant survival and 86.5% survival at 20 years in patients that survive long enough to see that benefit. Average range of motion postoperatively in non-reverse arthroplasty versus reverse actually favors reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. They get up to 90 degrees of abduction and forward elevation, which is significantly better than the large hemiarthroplasties. The length of bone resected, though, correlates directly with functional outcome. Again, mainly because of the muscular control of that shoulder. Distal humeral replacements are a uniaxial joint with a high amount of constraint. So this is a pure fixed hinge with no rotational component. So as a result, these tend to fail via aseptic loosening a lot more common. So there's about an 8% aseptic loosening rate at only 28 months. So just barely over two years, almost 10% of these are going to get loose. There's a 15% infection rate at mean follow-up of 28 months as well, probably because of poor soft tissue coverage surrounding these. Functional and outcome score are better in tumor patients than non-tumor patients, probably owing to the fact that many patients will sort of trade any functional outcome for eradication of their tumor. So in general, they tend to look at their tumor surgery more favorably than they would if this were an arthroplasty surgery. Average flexion contracture, though, is significant, about 15 degrees up to 35 degrees. And average flexion arc is limited only to about 85 total degrees, but up to 130 degrees. So some outcomes can be very good with these. The other issue is, is especially if you're getting into the proximal ulna where you have tumors there, some of these may have to be manufactured custom and then with a long stem that goes down the ulnar shaft. So these can get rather difficult to accomplish depending on the location of the tumor, the prognosis of the patient, and what the expected functional goals are going to be. Total humerus replacements can provide satisfactory function with maintenance of elbow and wrist range of motion. However, shoulder range of motion tends to be incredibly limited, probably again because of the lack of the soft tissue control and constraint. There's really no improvement in range of motion even with lat and trap transfers, probably owing to the fact that it's very difficult to get muscle to attach meaningfully to metallic endoprosthetics. There's a 78% five-year implant survival. All of these show proximal migration to some degree, again, because they're all essentially rotator cuff deficient shoulders. Painful impingement can occur, and if it does, it's usually treated with head removal and just leave the stem in. Basically, the point of a total humeral replacement with few exceptions is just to salvage the hand. As long as they have a hand that can help them with some daily tasks and small activities of daily living, that does much better for them and their quality of life long term than an amputation would of the upper extremity. So this is sort of bridging the gap in order to salvage the hand without providing meaningful shoulder function. Proximal femur replacements now switch into the lower extremity tend to do much better than what we see in the upper extremity. There's a five-year implant survival of about 92.5% lower rates of dislocation when you do a hemiarthroplasty compared to total hip arthroplasty, probably simply because of head size. Hemiarthroplasty over time can lead to acetabular osteoarthrosis and protrusio, yet only about 4% of these actually need a revision to total hip arthroplasty for symptomatic arthrosis. In fact, often most of the radiographic findings are clinically asymptomatic. Both functional results and survival rate are increased for primary tumors versus metastatic disease. However, both groups achieve local disease control, reliable pain relief, and fair or good functional outcome results in about 87% of patients. So this does provide generally a durable construct with excellent survivability and excellent function. In the non-tumor setting, about 96% of these at one year and 95% at five years will still be revision free. So these tend to have excellent long-term results. There is about 11.4% dislocation rate, probably because of the limited soft tissue constraints around the hip with that much soft tissue stripping to replace, and it's accounted for in all of the revisions. About 3.8% are complicated by infection, usually managed with chronic suppressive antibiotic treatment, especially in this particular paper. 
there's about a 6.3% VTE rate, so very high when you get into these larger lower extremity surgeries, so adequate prophylaxis is certainly warranted here, but you do have to weigh that against the bleeding risks as well with that much soft tissue dissection. There's about a 7.6% 30-day and 12.7% one-year mortality rate. So these are substantial surgeries that you know, the goals need to be clear with the patient, you need to be clear in terms of the expectations, but also the risks when you're having that risk and benefit conference as well as the implications for informed consent. For this, no outcome scores or quality of life indices were used, so it is sort of difficult to predict that, but anecdotally I can tell you this does provide an excellent means of limb salvage for a lot of patients that otherwise would be staring at either a massive girdle stone resection arthroplasty or hip disarticulation amputation, both of which can be relatively debilitating. Distal femoral replacement has about a 55% complication rate when combined with proximal tibial replacements. Rotation plasty is usually going to be performed in younger patients due to similar functional scores, but better pain relief, less need for walking aids, less need for revision surgery, lower infection risk, and more predictable leg lengths. 5 and 20 year implant survival of distal femur replacements is about 83% and 42% respectively. 10 year incidence of aseptic loosening, all cause revision, and any operation is 17%, 28%, and 46% respectively. So there are some significant issues associated with these, but again, depending on the goals, depending on the status of the patient, outcomes can be satisfactory, and these are easily revisable as well because they tend to retain at least some bone where you can always bail out to a bigger distal femoral replacement or even a total femoral replacement if needed. You need to expect that function and range of motion at best is only going to be about 80% of the normal knee. This is probably due to the soft tissue stripping, the lack of muscular control, and especially in tumor resection where you're removing soft tissues as well. The linea aspera tends to be what we utilize to help determine the posterior axis and therefore the anterior axis of the femur to help with alignment and patellofemoral tracking. However, what we do know is that the linea aspera tends to actually be externally rotated about 10 to 15 degrees from the intercondylar line. So it's not straight posterior and so it may not be the best without compensating for that in terms of determining your AP. So implant trialing here during surgery to help establish that proper patellofemoral mechanics intraoperatively before you commit to the final rotational implant is going to be key for these cases. Total femoral replacement is involving replacing the entire femur with an artificial hip at the top and an artificial knee at the bottom. You could do a hemiarthroplasty of the hip at the top or total hip arthroplasty, but at the bottom, generally you need to do a tibial resurfacing simply because of the lack of constraint when you put this onto the native tibia with no ligamentous attachments. You need competence of the extensor mechanism because that's the major determinant of functional outcome in these patients. So if during the tumor resection you have to devitalize the anterior compartment or resect the femoral nerve, they're going to have a hard time with function with this leg. You want no active hip abduction or knee flexion for six to eight weeks to protect the muscles that have been reattached to the prosthesis and try and get as much function out of that as possible. Flexion range of motion ranges from 20 to 120 degrees at the knee with a mean of about 60 degrees with good function in most patients. Again, Here's where you're into the limb salvage operations where you're just trying not to have a high level amputation. So functional outcomes here are obviously not going to be fantastic. Risks are going to be high, but you're able to salvage the limb and give them a platform to walk on, which does better for most patients in the long run, especially in terms of chronic pain and neuropathic pain seen with high level amputations. Infection or tibial component loosening are the most common sources of failure in these particular patients. Proximal tibia replacement typically means replacing the upper end of the tibia to include the patellar tendon and tibial tubercle. So the problem with that is now your extensor mechanism is completely disrupted and when you tack it back down the healing is always a little bit suboptimal. Additionally, because the tibia is directly subcutaneous as it travels down the leg, you get soft tissue coverage and infection problems that are significant with this procedure. Therefore, basically every one of these procedures does need a proximally pedicled medial gastric nemius flap to come up and over the top of the prosthesis. 
That way you get your soft tissue coverage to help prevent infection and you also provide a better anchoring point in addition to the prosthesis for the extensor mechanism. Studies have shown that when you incorporate the gastrocnemius flap to the extensor mechanism, it does significantly improve functional outcomes. So when you swing this flap, it's the medial sural artery, which is often tested on the OITE and boards, and it needs to be rotated to provide that tissue coverage. Because the medial gastrocnemius is usually balled up and held pretty tightly by its aponeurosis, you have to either checkerboard the aponeurosis or remove it entirely to spread it wide enough to get the coverage that you need. This does lower infection rate from over one-third down to close to 10%. The extensor mechanism, as we talked about, should be attached to it. You want to use a really heavy, non-absorbable suture, something like Dacron tape or cotton E2 fibers. Function is good to excellent in about 88% of patients based on the MSTS criteria, but extensor lag is certainly expected with up to about 20 degrees in 80% of patients. Extensor lag does improve continuously for about a year after surgery. So you want to wait for revision advancement of everything. You want to see where they can get first. Give them a year or even two to fully functionally recover. And if they're in a place where they're not functional, you can always talk about going in there and advancing the patellar tendon or shortening up the quadriceps in order to help increase their lever arm. These have an 88% and 75% 5 and 10 year implant survival. Partial pelvic replacements now, there are no current implants available off the shelf in the United States, although there are in Europe. You can get customized implants in the United States and custom triflange components are probably the most commonly utilized here. Many of these are customized based off of CT or MRI imaging and then 3D printed modeling. They do require computer navigation for anatomic insertion, but in reality that's not always necessary during surgery. However, if it doesn't line up exactly perfectly or fit exactly right as the computer may have predicted, you may have to get out your burr and either burr down the bone to get it to fit or occasionally burr down the backside of the implant to contour it appropriately so that it fits the bone properly. There's limited data on these in the literature, but early studies, at least on the custom triflange components, are very promising and do finally provide one of the better means of reconstructing the acetabulum that we've had. Saddle prosthesis is really in here for historical perspective. This is not really utilized anymore because they basically have nearly 100% failure rate and the failures tend to be catastrophic. There was early loosening and failure from over constraint of the implant when the implant was fixed to the pelvis. So that's why they created this saddle that basically hinges and rotates on the resected ilium. But the problem with that is it would rock and dislocate, it could fracture the ilium, it could even just over time bore through the ilium as it would wear. Additionally, you can see it's a completely constrained hip joint that over constrained everything. So you had all kinds of mechanical and functional problems with these, infection rates were high. And so the problem is when we looked at these, we found shorter operative time, rapid recovery, but poor operative function and range of motion in patients and high risk of complications. So sciatic palsy, dislocation, infection, bone fracture, modular component fracture, heterotopic bone formation. And when we really started looking at it, function was actually better compared to an external hemipelvectomy, but there were high complication rates. And so the amount of surgeries that these patients need, and most of them ultimately ended up bailing out to either an internal or external hemipelvectomy anyway. So these have mostly been abandoned, not really available much anymore. And if they do, they're only in extreme salvage cases. Mostly anymore, we're using either complex allograft prosthetic composites, or as we talked about, custom 3D printed reconstructions. Total pelvic replacements exist when you have a massive pelvic tumor and you're trying to prevent an external hemipelvectomy. You can create a cementoplasty pelvis with rebar and screw fixation to the sacrum, lumbar spine, and contralateral pubis, such as in these images where all of those screws are basically used as rebar with a ton of cement. The problem with these is there's no constraint, so their dislocation is a major problem, and if you do constrain it, then loosening of the pelvic prosthetic from whatever it's attached to is a major problem as well. It's a huge chunk of metal inside their abdomen basically, so this is a real high infection rate and, and complication rate. Limited data in the literature on these, 45% major complication rate and 100% minor complication rate. 
seldom used in the US. Again, usually an allograft pelvis is preferred. Still though, nearly 50% failure rate with those con versus just going with the external hemipelvectomy. Intercalary endoprosthetics are a prosthesis that spans a space in the shaft of a long bone between native proximal and distal ends of the bone. So you're retaining joint surfaces and in a child sometimes you're doing this to retain physes but replacing the bone in the middle. Custom intercalary endoprostheses result in reconstruction comparable with, if not better than, allograft use. Intercalary aloe and autograft should be supplemented with stainless steel plates and screws. If you resect greater than seven centimeters or post-operative chemotherapy is anticipated, you want to consider supplementing an allograft with a vascularized fibular autograft. A double barrel autograft is where you salvage both fibulas, which further improves biointegration and decreases fracture risk. But these are long surgeries with plastic surgery to get all of that plugged in. Morbidity is high. Failure rates are still high. So much of the paradigm shift currently is more towards, again, metallic intercalary endoprosthetics. Expandable mega endoprosthetics are for pediatric patients and the growing patient. The goal is to try to achieve as close to equal leg lengths as possible at skeletal maturity, knowing that revision surgery will be needed along the way or even at that point for a more permanent adult endoprosthetic. The only other viable options are amputation, rotation plasty, or an adult endoprosthetic with a contralateral epiphysiodesis or ipsilateral leg lengthening procedure. There's a 40% chance of revision prior to skeletal maturity with the right medical repiphysis, which was probably the biggest one of these put in in sort of the early 2000s. But the complication rates were so high that essentially we have abandoned the right medical repiphysis. The most common one used in the United States is probably the Stanmore growing endoprosthetic, which uses an electromagnetic lengthening device Again, though, a lot of these need to be revised to adult prosthetics or the child's young enough that they outgrow the maximal lengthening available of the prosthesis and will have to be revised to a second growing prosthesis. Function remains good to excellent in about 85% of patients with these. But beware of cementing the component because cement can reach and kill the physis at the other end of the bone if you're not restricting it. So you can create some problems with this. And so these are sort of the first of many surgery for these kids. But again, the goal here is just limb salvage and whatever you have to do to do that. So again, it involves a very thorough discussion with the families about expectations, goals, and expected outcomes as well as expected future procedures required to continue to try and salvage the limb. The Myomet Compress is a new device out on the market that provides sort of a novel osseointegration via compression. So it uses a short spindle cell plug which helps salvage bone and helps fix into short segments of bone rather than having to bail out to total bone replacements. And it provides a compressive mechanism that uses Wolf's Law to obtain bony ingrowth onto the prosthesis. It provides compression at 400, 600, or 800 PSI depending on the cortical thickness of the patient and helps to prevent stress shielding more proximally as well by having a better transition of weight bearing loads from the prosthesis to the bone. It's the most durable FDA approved fixation method for distal femoral megaprosthetics on the market at 10 years out. There are novel failures seen with bone necrosis from over compression as well as fractures from the compression. So my tips on this one are you need to have your bony cut exactly perfectly perpendicular. If there's any angular deforming force to that compression, it will fracture. So I usually do these using C-arm and multiplanar imaging to make sure that that cut is dead perfect perpendicular. You also want to try and save a periosteal sleeve. So when I'm planning on a tumor resection, what I do with these is I plan on my bone resection at a certain level to get wide of the tumor, but instead what I do is that's where I incise the periosteum take the periosteum up another one to two centimeters, resect the bone there, salvage that one to two centimeters of periosteum and try and bring that down and purse string it over the top of the spindle plug that anchors there. I think with that I get better osseointegration, less risk of fracture and less risk of failure. Current recommendation with this prosthesis because of that early osteonecrosis is non-weight bearing for about six weeks after implantation of one of these to allow that bone to recover before you stress it too much and risk fracture. There are also some rotational failures seen with this because of how small that plug is. 
And so there are additional fixation methods now created that utilize locking screws in the anchoring plug there that can fix into the distal bone to provide rotational stability. So as you can imagine, complication rates are very high with Megando prosthetics. DVT is one of the biggest ones, as we talked about earlier, up to 7% in proximal femur replacements. Overall incidence with Megando prosthetics, especially in lower extremity tumor surgery, is about 4%. Unfortunately, when we try to study this, there's no real difference in this compared to any or no chemoprophylaxis. So we've looked at aspirin, Coumadin, Lovenox, Heparin, Fragmin, which is Delta Parin, multiple other agents, and what we find is the incidence stays at about 4%. There seem to be a coagulopathy in tumor patients combined with lower extremity surgery that perhaps none of these target and we don't fully understand. So again, you also have to weigh the risk of bleeding in these patients with the use of over chemoprophylaxis. So this is a, a tough situation to be in and if they get a DVT, it will have to be treated, but sometimes you may wanna go with mechanical prophylaxis only because of bleeding risk. And so you have to take that extra risk. So again, having this discussion with patients and families so that they understand their risks and what they're in for. Implant failures are obviously one of the biggest causes of failure here. Loosening, fracture, infection, progression of the tumor, and dislocation are all big time problems with these mega endoprosthetics because of the soft tissue constraint issues. Infection occurs in about 3 to 30 percent of these with 50 percent failing typical periprosthetic infection treatment. So you can do a great two-stage revision and 50 percent of them are still going to be infected. So chronic suppressive antibiosis, amputation, bailouts, all kinds of things are the future for many patients that get mega endoprosthetic. So these, although provide a great means of limb salvage surgery in many patients, also can have major catastrophic failure. Dislocation, especially of the polyaxial joints, such as the upper humerus and upper femur, do have about a 20% dislocation rate, but 64% 12-year survival with proximal femoral replacement, which is pretty good. So failure modes and classification. This was failure modes of megaendoprosthetics in the setting of tumor surgery, now become known as the Henderson classification when he wrote it up with his colleagues at Moffitt Cancer Center down in Tampa. And essentially this was described for tumor surgery only, but it is helpful in terms of describing megaendoprosthetic failures for all cause with the exception of tumor progression obviously is only specific to tumor surgery, but the majority of these failures can occur even in the setting of complex revision arthroplasty. So failure was defined as unplanned revision of a portion or the entire prosthesis, a periprosthetic fracture, soft tissue reconstruction necessary to restore joint stability, endoprosthetic removal without revision, or amputation. What they found was it was almost 50-50 for mechanical and non-mechanical failures. The mechanical failures typically were a loss of normal function of the prosthesis or a loss of relationship between the endoprosthesis and the adjacent bone or soft tissue. A non-mechanical failure was a failure that did not compromise endoprosthetic function, such as infection or tumor progression. So what they found was type 1 were what they defined as the soft tissue failures, so aseptic dehiscence, poor soft tissue tension, these tended to be more common in the polyaxial shoulder and hip joints, most common, associated with the shortest mean time to failure, usually issues with instability. Type 2 failures were aseptic loosening. So these included subsidence even early on, as well as late aseptic loosening, highest in the distal femur, and most commonly in uniaxial or hinged joints, the knee and the elbow. It's associated with the longest mean time to failure, and there's a lower risk with press fitting compared to cementing techniques in their study. Type three are the structural failures. So periprosthetic fracture is the big example there. These are the highest in the distal humerus and distal femur, again, surrounding uniaxial joints and lowest in the proximal humerus and total femurs or polyaxial joints. Type four is the infection failures. This was a third of all of their cases. So infection is a major, major problem with mega endoprosthetics. It accounted for all total humerus failures and was higher in uniaxial joints compared to polyaxial. Again, probably because of better soft tissue coverage around our polyaxial joints rather than our uniaxial. It's the lowest risk in the proximal femoral replacement, and all tumor patients with endoprostheses should have routine antibiotics prophylaxis for all dental and invasive procedures, such as endoscopy, colonoscopy, etc. 
because this is such a major issue and these aren't exactly a, a typical arthroplasty. As average failure was 30 to 40 months from the index procedure, a lot of these were due to late hematogenous seeding. So that's why the recommendation is currently to prophylax whenever you can and always be on the lookout for this and maintaining patient's health status and nutritional status appropriately throughout their life. Type 5 failures were the tumor progression failure. These are the highest in the distal humerus and proximal femur and lowest in total femurs and total knee arthroplasty with conventional CCK or hinged components. These occurred two times more commonly in primary tumor resection compared to treatment of metastases, but probably likely due to shorter lifespan with patients with metastases, so there wasn't enough time to see the tumor progression failures. Type 4 and 5 failures were more likely to result in amputation. The rates of failure decreased over time, probably reflecting improvements in technique and technology over time. Mean overall time to failure was about four years, so a lot of patients can be expected to have good outcomes with these for quite a while, especially when you're talking about patients with cancer, especially in the setting of metastases or high-risk sarcomas. Four years is a long enough time to provide them a really good quality of life. Shortest mean time was seen in distal humerus replacements, uh, failing at an average of about 11 months. And in the soft tissue failures, longest mean time was seen in the proximal humerus replacements, out to 53 months, and mechanical failures. So what do we do when one of these fails? Salvage becomes difficult. Really, the issues are going to be, you know, repeat endoprosthesis for a mechanical failure or osteosynthesis, plus or minus strut graft as indicated. You may need to revise to a larger endoprosthesis with more bone replaced. You may need to amputate. For infection, the only viable options are usually amputation or a really complex two-stage revision. Again, chronic suppressive antibiotics may be your friend here. And you may need to get creative with antibiotic cement spacers. So some people will take an intramedullary hip screw. What I do with that is I then take the bulb syringe take the rubber handle off of that that's round and fill that with cement, put it over the lag screw and that becomes my femoral head, coat the nail with the cement and that's my femur replacement. What other people will do is they'll take out their mega endoprosthetic, they will sterilize it by running it through the autoclave and then reinsert it back in the patient coating it in antibiotic cement and use that as their articulating spacer. Bear in mind that additional time off of chemotherapy if this is a tumor patient is going to help dictate what you do. So if you have an osteosarcoma or an Ewing sarcoma patient that gets a septic periprosthetic infection early on and they need to get back on their chemotherapy, you have to remember the main goal here is to save the patient's life and eradicate the tumor. So you've got to get them back on chemotherapy. So you may not have time to get them through a two-stage revision or it may not be safe to have them on antibiotics and infected while they're on chemotherapy. So you may have to bail out right away to an amputation with the goal of getting them back on their chemo sooner. Here's a list of my sources for this particular talk. And again, call, text, or email at any time if you have any questions. And now I'll leave you with my Pacific Northwest Pride slide, the ghost ship right off the coast of Astoria, Oregon, right at the mouth of the Columbia River, where about 100 years ago a cargo ship had run aground here. And when the tide goes out, you can actually walk right up to it. So it's a pretty cool spot.